dropping in on you. Uh, I don't plan on being long, but I, I, I needed to talk about this. I, I need to sort of frame it, and I, I want to leave you with a question. I want to, uh, first of all, challenge black men to really think about this, and I want to challenge the black collective to really spend some time to examine why we do some things and why it is counterproductive uh, to us. Okay, so uh, before I do that, I want to remind you to support the work we do at the Odyssey Project. The information to do so is in the box. Uh, if you're familiar with what we do from research to program development to community outreach and so much more, uh, you know. Uh, this is a new, we've been doing this for 20 years officially. We have been doing it um, and uh, chronicling it online for 15 years. Uh, have had a major presence on uh, social media for during their 12 years. So we've been doing this uh, for quite a while live and in living color and we need your support also don't forget if you haven't sponsored your space uh, in my 25th book uh, chasing the ghost quest for uh, the quest for black wealth uh, the information on how you can do that and what's all what that is all about is also in the description box look I'm, I'm gonna move straight into this uh, so uh, in case you didn't hear, and if you're not a sports fan, you may not have heard, but it's, it's starting to gain traction. It's starting to become a mainstream conversation. Um, and that is the head coach of the Las Vegas Raiders, who are formerly Oakland Raiders, formerly Los Angeles Raiders. John Gruden uh, wrote an email about someone um, I think it was a part of the Players Association or something like that. A guy by the name of Demaris uh, Smith. And uh, the, the email recently surfaced and everybody is losing their minds about what was said. Uh, there's a question of whether or not, um, for those who love to give the benefit of the doubt, there's a question of whether or not this was a racist statement. Uh, I'm gonna actually read the statement to you. Uh, uh, I'm going to read the statement to you. Um, let's see if I can pull it back up because I just had it. I'm going to read the statement, then I'm going to get up into it. The, the guy's name is Demaris Smith. He called him Dumbaris Smith. Has lips the size of Michelin tires. I haven't seen the picture of Demaris Smith, so I don't know if that's uh, an accurate assess assessment. I know it's not the size of Michelin tires. Uh, but there's a question going on about whether or not it was it had racial overtones. Uh, first of all, there has to be a difference. There has to be a distinction and definition of what racism is versus what um, uh, bigotry is, what hatred is, because racism doesn't require hatred or bigotry to be practiced. Racism is a system that favors one a particular group over another and sets up advantages for one and disadvantages for the other so that the other can remain in a position of power. Racism is normally institutionalized. It's within the very fibers of the way that we do business, the way that we handle politics, the way that we handle finances. It can be seen across the board. It can explain many of the disproportionate uh, realities of life. It can explain why one group is at the peak of the socioeconomic ladder and the other group is consistently at the bottom. It can explain a lot of different things. Someone's statement that obviously carries vitriol, hatred, disrespect, and contempt by its very by, by, by the very definition of racism doesn't necessarily qualify. It qualifies as bigotry for sure. It qualifies as being uh, uh, prejudice. Uh, qualifies for a bunch of things that says, hey, this person doesn't have a very high um, opinion of black people and yet deals in a world where black people dominate a certain specter of the industry. 70% 70, 70 of the players in the NFL are black. Okay, so you're coaching men who are black. You're handling men who are black. Uh, not at the time he said this, he wasn't in the NFL. He was a commentator. 
he had retired from coaching. He was a commentator, and he was emailing one person talking about this person, Demoris Smith. And so there's a limit to what the NFL can legally do because he wasn't a part of the organization when he did it. Now, what they can do is sever ties with him simply because they don't want to be associated with him. But as far as levying punishment, they're limited because he didn't do it while he was employed by them. So they can either sit up and say, we're going to cut ties with you because we don't want to be associated with something like that or not. But what you got to understand, there's a bigger picture here. And the problem I have with this isn't what he did. My problem is the response of black men in specific. Now, my thing is, I am a an advocate for black men. I am an advocate for um, I am an advocate for. Hold on, put this back over here. Um, supporting and understanding what we go through as a collective, black men specifically, but blacks as a whole. Uh, I don't want to sit up and marginalize how someone feels, but I want to talk about why we respond in certain ways. My problem with the whole thing is seeing black men, black millionaires, get on TV and literally cry because this man said what he said. Cry. Now, don't get me wrong. See, I understand the accumulative effect of racism and how it magnifies prejudice, how it magnifies bigotry, and how it is often uh, misconstrued the, the, the latter is often misconstrued for the former. In other words, a lot of people see bigotry and, and prejudice as racism in and of itself. Racism doesn't require that I hate you. It just requires that I operate within the scope of things that provides favor to me above you. I can actually be cool with you, but if I'm operating in a system that benefits me better than it benefits you and maybe even exploits you, then I'm a racist. Many of your friends are racist because they know the system works for them and they've done nothing to change it. They are consistently benefiting from it. So we have to first of all understand it because Neely Fuller Jr. said that until you understand white supremacy racism, how it works, how it impacts you, how it affects you, everything you thought you know will only confuse you. And so what a lot of people are, are confused. But nevertheless, my problem isn't even in the misunderstanding of racism. My problem is in the response to your misunderstanding. You, my response is, why are you on a, a national television show or maybe even an international television show uh, because the NFL is going international uh, show crying? See, that's what they love to see. They love to see the black man broken. They love to see the black man playing the role of powerlessness, uh, being powerless. Um, they love to see the black man operating in a sphere of, please, don't do this to me. Anything that puts you in a position of power powerlessness they they love to see that my thing is he said what he said he meant what he said no matter what comes out no matter how much pr work is done he said exactly what he meant and exactly how he fell and from what i heard uh on my own years ago when he was coaching tampa bay what i heard from people who actually played face to face this is dude now now of course the other side of this if they, if it ain't a black man, if it ain't a black man on 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 the television crying, Randy Moss, and and a couple of others, uh, oh woe and oh woe is me, and then it's the other black men that they're parading out to be character witnesses for this guy. See, my thing is, you know him, and you can sit up and say what you want to say with him. He wrote it. He wrote it, and there were more than one. There was there, there's more than one email. So he has a habit of disrespecting black men, looking down on black men, seeing himself superior to black men, of uh, 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 assuming that call, saying a man's lips is big is an insult, first of all. Uh, and some other thing, you are actually offended because he says dude's lips were big. My thing is I could give a fuck less about what he thinks about a black man's lips. What he didn't like was a black man was in a position of power to do something that he really had no control over. That's what he had the problem with, is that as time goes, there are more black men in positions and roles of power that can negatively impact him than what he was probably used to 10 or 20 years before he actually wrote that 
email. That's a problem with white men right now is that they're seeing more black men, not black puppets, black men, black men who will speak firmly, black men who will hold them to the flame, black men who have no problem holding their ground and standing their own and representing what they were designed and hired to represent, not folding, not sitting up taking underhanded deals, not being puppets and buffers, but actually doing what they were sent to do. They don't like that. That was a time you would get killed for that. And so they don't like that. Now, the thing is, we're going to pretend in this whole conversation that an organization in which 90% of its ownership is approaching 70 or over 70, and they're white men with the exception of maybe two people. And we're going to pretend that this is a conversation uh, that goes on all the time. We're not going to pretend that most of them think that way. We 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 we're what two or three years removed from when the late Bob McNair, the owner of the Texans, stood up and said we can't allow the inmates to run the asylum. We're going to act like Jerry Jones doesn't consistently go around and handle grown men, grown millionaires like their kids. We're going to consistently go around and act like these men who are 70, who lived in the height, who were alive during the height of Jim Crow segregation, where white men dominated and black men cowered. We're going to pretend that they don't do that. Now, I want to talk about why, that, why this is important. You got to understand that for years, black men understood that there's very survival depended upon keeping the white man comfortable because the truth of the matter is their very existence made the white man uncomfortable the white man had to see docility the white man had to see uh docit approval and acceptance of roles by the black man if the white man thought for a second that you really knew who you were and you were standing up and you were squaring your shoulders and you were ready to hold your own your life, were, your life was in jeopardy. So black man developed the, uh, the ability to sit up and be invisible. And, when, when, and, and then when they were noticed in their inv invisibility, they went out of their ways to make sure that who noticed them didn't feel threatened by them. And it's displayed in the behavior that I noticed in, in the discussions that are going and surrounding this. In the big grand scope of things, I don't give a damn what he said. In the grand scope of things, even if it was me he was saying it about, he don't shake ground with me. No white man shakes ground with me. I stopped letting white men shake ground with me before I became a man. I was reared by a man who had a second grade education. And when he walked in rooms and spaces that included white men in the hometown that he would take me back to, they had respect for him because he didn't fold. And unless you were coming from him and you were coming from him, unless you were coming for him and coming for him all the way, you might as well not come at all because he wasn't going to be. He was ready at any time. And that's the thing. Martin Luther King said something, and I, I hold it to truth. There are a lot of things I don't agree with that Dr. King said, especially early on. Uh, and I, 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 uh, But I, I love the man that he became toward the end of his life. It cost him his life. But it, it gave validity to this very statement that he said. Look, he said, if a man doesn't have something for, for which he is willing to die, he's not fit to live. What are you standing for? What are you believing in? What are you ready to fight for? We talked about this uh, on Saturday morning during the segment of the, t uh, of the teachers with Dr. Michael Blanchard. We had uh, a, a beautiful and wonderful guest that we've both known for quite a while, Sister uh, Latava Mel Mel uh, Mel Melabajingo. And we talked about uh, this one thing. What are you willing to stand up for? What are you willing to die for? What is it that is so huge that you won't fold when things get hot, when it gets heated, when it gets... See, we're still in that mindset that we don't want to upset them. We're still in that mindset we want to keep them comfortable. We're still in that mindset where we want them to favor us. I don't care if you favor me. I know my value. When are we going to learn? When you are the commodity, you have way more leverage than you think. None of those bastards can get their old ass out there and play the game. Who do they need to play the game? Who do they need to put a product on the field? 
70% of that is black. This is in many other industries, many other situations. We've got to stop sitting up playing small. We've got to stop buying into the notion of yesteryear where we had to keep quiet, where we had to keep silent, where we had to make master know everything was okay and I wasn't going to be a problem. Oh, I'm a problem. I'm a problem. If you mean my people harm, I'm a problem. If you mean my family harm, I'm a problem. If you mean me a harm, if you mean me harm, I'm a problem. Am I going out looking for trouble? Absolutely not. Would I love to exist in harmony? Absolutely. But what I will not do is fold thinking that me playing soft and being the bearer of peace will stop a person who is intent on harming me from harming me. That is never the case. You sitting up begging for your life is not going to stop a person who is intent on killing you. A person, you sitting up, sitting up saying everything you think a person wants to hear is not going to stop a person who has made up in their mind they're going to break your heart from breaking your heart. What you're going to have to learn is you better be you and you better defend you with all you got you better stand strong you better square your shoulders and you better make it known if you're gonna bring it bring it but if you come for me no I'm gonna be waiting on you you gotta sit up and stop letting people walk all over you and all they're gonna get is tears tears never stopped someone who meant you harm you know when I shed tears I shed tears when I look up and realize I hurt somebody that's when I shed tears, that I made a move, that I made a decision, that I did something that I, 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 that has caused someone. I don't cry when you hurt me. I'm coming for you. At the very minimum, I'm going to get rid of you. I'm going to get you out of my life. You mean me no good. But I'm not going to sit up and whine and cry. It never works. It never stops somebody from coming for you. You better man up. You better square up. You better speak your mind. Why? Oh, I know. They writing that check. I get it. I get it. You better have something you're willing to stand for. You better have something you're willing to live for. You better have something you're willing to die for. The moment that you have all of those things, it changes the game. You may feel comfortable. You may live comfortable. But that's got to be something inside of you that's bigger than all of that. My manhood trumps it all. Do I want to live comfortable? Absolutely. Do I want to build this thing that I'm building for my family? Absolutely. Do I want to leave this life early? Early? Absolutely not. But will I allow all those things to push me into a place where I'm not even a man anymore? Can't do it. Because at the end of the day, I, I, I need to know that my kids looked at me and said, he did exactly what he taught us to do. He lived his life exactly how he told us to live. He didn't play around with it. He put it out there. He gave it all. I can live with that no matter what comes. What I can't live with is playing small and make some other chunk feel large. You want to feel large in my space, you better be all you can be and come with it. If you can't hang, you need to kick rocks. I will not shrink myself to make. Now, I don't do anything to make people feel small. I never speak down. I, I saw a, a comment on a post the other day. And the person says, you never... Uh, come at us in a way to try to make us feel like smaller. Don't. My thing is, there are some things I might say that might be outside the spectrum of normal, but my whole thing is, I'm just me. I'm not better than you, but I'm, I'm me and I'm good with me and I'm a beast at what I do and I'm a beast at being me and I'm never going to shrink me because you're uncomfortable. What I will do is respect you as long as you respect me. What I will do is care of whether or not I'm actually being effective in communicating the things I want to communicate. See, I had to learn that too. I had to learn. It ain't about impressing people, Rick. It's not imp about impressing them with your grammatical structure or your writing. It's not about impressing them with your, your vocabulary. While my active vocabulary is larger than the average person, and sometimes words are going to flow out because that's the natural flow of my conversation. The faster I talk, the more uh, words are going to come out. But it doesn't make me better. I'm not better than anybody, but nobody's better than me. So nobody can make me feel small. I'm a walking mind. But what I, what I need to see is black brothers walking in theirs. I need to see this black brothers standing up and sitting up saying, that's some bull crap. I, don't, I, I need one of those brothers to actually say, say, you know what? I don't care how he, how, how he explains it away, that's bull crap. I, I need somebody to sit up and call it what it is. 
that's the thing. That's bull crap. Now, is it something to get all in the uproar about? Not for me. Because I probably done said something about them. I, 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 I'm not going to let somebody's bumping shake me. You said his lips were big. Okay. Your ass flat. Your nose screwed up. You don't got lips. Okay. I, we can do this all day. See, my thing is, ain't nothing more beautiful than full black lips. I don't know the dude, and I'm not talking about his lips in particular. Sp actually speaking from a male looking at black women. But I'm sure black women look at guys with full lips and black guys with full lips. And if they're truly Afrocentric and in love with themselves, they see nothing wrong with that. I don't see nothing wrong with my wide nose. Love it to death. Don't want no pointy skinny ass nose. So you sitting up talking about that stuff isn't going to shake me. What it tells me is that you noticed it. And it bothered you enough to say something about it. That's on you. But my problem is, for the person that bothered, first of all, stop letting that bull crap bother you. Second of all, stop acting like a little kid when it does. If somebody does something that bothers me, they're going to hear from me. And if they're not careful, they're going to feel me. That's never going to be a part of me that I become so educated I can't touch your ass. That's what makes me the husband I am. Because the one thing I'm going to provide my family that I know I can provide them as long as I can stand up on my feet. And that's an environment of security. Things may get shaky with money because money comes and goes. It ebbs and flows. You can sit up and hedge yourself and protect yourself. And you can do that too. To but you can't control everything. The one thing you can't control, if I'm breathing and I got my strength, I'm bringing the pain. If you touch mine, if you come at me crazy, I'm going to touch you. That's got to be a man. You can never be too educated to touch somebody. You can never be too too wealthy to handle somebody. Uh, why, my thing is we have to understand that the core of our manhood is the ability to make sure that nobody around us feels insecure. Starting with us. You're putting your insecurities on Front Street on national television. They know your weaknesses. They know that you 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 you'll bump and talk noise to other brothers and you'll sit up and talk all but when it comes down to it, and this dude that doesn't even have any bearing on you, you are so afraid of making other white men afraid for checking this white man. Because he doesn't even have the power to do anything with you. He's not your boss, but he's one of them. And you know how they love fraternity work. So you work, man, you better stand up for yourself. Don't get me wrong, I understand that comes at a price. But I don't want to see another black man on national television crying because of something a white man said. Cry when you lose somebody. Cry when you cause pain. Cry when it's something completely out of your control <coughs> that reaches the core. But don't cry because of what some chump said. Call him what he is. A bigoted chunk and keep it moving. It is what it is. And I know a lot of people ain't gonna like this. But they're getting in. The one thing that you should know about me by now is I didn't I don't do what I do to be liked. I do what I do because I think I have something to offer my people. And I know sometimes I'm going to say things that they don't like because I'm going to challenge them to get out of the spaces they're in. See, people don't like coming out of their comfort zones. People don't like coming out of uh, places where they, 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 they've created these little nooks and crannies where they can sit up and they can pretend. They don't want to be called out and put on, on, on front street and told to be accountable. So when I do that, no, you don't like Now, when I'm talking about something that benefits you, yo, doc, 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 you doc, 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 doc. Oh, but when I sit up and I hit you, then you get quiet or, 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 or you start coming. And see, the thing is, I didn't come here to get likes. I didn't come here to get pats on the back. I didn't come here for viral videos. I came here because I'm laying down something that I hope outlives me. That's why I've written 24 books and on the 25th book, because I'm putting some things out there that will outlive me. I'm leaving something that will probably not really truly manifest and flourish until I left this place. That's unfortunately how it's been with the people who have been impactful in this world. We don't notice what we had until it's gone, but I'm good with that because I don't need validation. I don't need the approbation and approval of anyone. I came here to do what I came here to do, and that's what I'm gonna do. And it leaves me in a real good spot because I don't need 
somebody to tell me who I am, I can be real bold in what I speak. And I don't have to worry about it. Now, when I'm on this channel, uh, which is YouTube, and you'll probably see it on some other channels as well, but when I'm on YouTube, I know what I can say without getting the channel took. It's not that I care what people think about me, but the channel serves a purpose. And until we can get to where we can have our own platforms completely and in total control, then I got to be careful what I say. But I say it, I just know what, I, what words can be used and what can't. I'm never going to sit up and hold an opinion. I give my opinion. I just know I can't say that word. Oh, but that's the beauty of having a large vocabulary. I got a bunch of ways I can say it. And that's why a bunch of them mad at, at Dave Chappelle right now because he's a genius at being able to say it without saying it. And, 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 and that's the thing. It's kind of funny right when I mentioned that somebody commented on the video that I put up about that uh, special. But anyway, that's all I said. I had to come out and talk about that. A lot of people might not even know what's going on, but it's a big thing in the NFL right now. Um, you know, and supposedly there's some meetings taking place today of deciding what, what, what's going to happen, if anything. I don't really care. My whole thing is we're caught up in the wrong thing anyway. That's their world. That's how they're doing things. That's how they've always done things. But I'd be damned if they're going to have me crying. And my thing is, I'm a huge fan of what Randy Moss has done as an athlete. One one of the best to ever do it. Probably one of the most gifted, if not the gift, physically most gifted athlete I've ever seen at the wide receiver position. Uh, but we have to be willing to be men. And, 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 and that goes to a point to where sometimes you got to stand on your own. And sometimes standing on your own means stepping out from underneath that safety shield that someone else has created for you that has you feeling so comfortable. On that note, look, I'm going to get out of here. Um, again, show your love and support. Um, the information is in the description box. If you haven't signed up to sponsor space in my 25th book, go ahead and do that. That way you can celebrate somebody who's made a difference in your life. On that note, I'm out of here. You guys have an unbelievable day. Yeah, yeah.